MTN. Everywhere you go. He started creating the Dangote Empire straight out of college. Today he's the largest producer of cement in Nigeria. His empire includes production of sugar, rice, pasta and diesel, all things that people just can't live without. Through pure determination and hard work, Aliko Dangote is now placed number 51 on Forbes and is considered the richest man in Africa. We got some young aspiring moguls from all over the continent to sit down with the man. Let's meet our five panelists. I'm JJ Ayodele. I'm an MBA student and I'm from Nigeria. So I'm currently studying at New York University Stern School of Business, focusing in finance and entertainment media and technology. The plan where I'm done studying is to work for a major media and entertainment company that is focused in emerging markets, particularly Africa, uh, because it really is close to my heart for obvious reasons, and I think that the media entertainment industry as a whole is at a very interesting point in Africa, and I would like to be part of that growth. My name is Yomi Black. I'm a photographer, and I'm from the city of excellence, Lagos, Nigeria, popularly known as Las Guinea. I was born and bred in Lagos. I'm part of the Lagos hustle. Every average Lagosian has two or three jobs. So I'm a photographer. I run a discount service called YPM. I also shoot and edit videos. I always dreamed of employing 50,000 people. I feel like if I can pay 50,000 salaries, yeah, I can rest well in my grave. Hi, my name is Farai Chipungu. I'm a student and I'm from Harare, Zimbabwe. I left Zimbabwe originally as an exchange student to go to Australia for one year, and that ended up being about 14 years. Uh, I lived in Australia, I lived in South Africa for a couple of years, in England, and now in the States. And it's good to be able to sort of blend your African roots with lessons that you learn along the way in lots of other countries. My name is Jerry Lynn Mulva. I'm an artist and I am from Liberia. When the war started in Liberia, I was about seven years old and I was sold by a friend of my mother's. She sold me to a rebel guy somewhere in Kakata who later on took me to his parents in Seklipia, that's in Nimba County. And that's how I actually discovered that I could really sing because I joined the church choir. They took really good care of me. They made sure I went to church. In fact, that was the biggest thing for me. I strongly believe that everything in my life has been like a journey for me to where I am today. Because if I wasn't sold, probably I wouldn't really take it seriously that I could really sing. You know, it had its own negative experience and effects on my life, but hey, it's like a testimony for me. headquarters. Alhaji Ali Kodangote has agreed to let us into his private office for this interview. So let's go meet the richest man in Africa. I want to meet Dangote because he is the most successful businessman in Africa. Why wouldn't I want to meet Dangote? Come on, he's the richest man in Africa. That makes a lot of difference. I mean, it's certainly exciting to meet him, just given the level of success that he has, and also to mention the fact that he is the richest man in Africa. I mean, that in itself is a huge novelty and, and reason why I'd like to meet someone of that stature. I'd like to find out how he's done it, how he's created this wealth, and how it is that he manages to stay on top. He's just a great man. I'd love to meet him. He is Nigeria's very own Donald Trump. He has been listed as number 51 on Forbes' list of the richest people in the world. The News of Africa tags him as one of the 100 most influential Africans. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Alhaji Dangote. Thank you very much, sir, for your time. Thank you very much. I'd like to start from the very beginning, say when you were about uh, a teenager. What kind of kid were you? Were you really into your books all the time, or were you that guy who used to hang out and go to parties? <laughs> Not uh, really. Well, you know, I used to, you know, be a little bit naughty, you know, with really? a few friends, yes, you know, but, uh, well, you know, I wasn't really mixing with bad guys. I'm always uh, within my own, either relatives or, you know, family, friends. So we all uh, knew ourselves and, you know, I tried to be very, because my grandfather used to be a very strict person, so I always try to make sure that I don't cross the bounds, you know. 
Most of the people that I hang out with in the UK or the United States that happen to be African have a sense of high potential as to what the country can actually afford and also in terms of lifestyle as well. And I think what kind of helps that is images they see with regards to music videos and artists that are coming out of Africa and they, they're starting to see a different side of Africa, which is actually what piqued my interest in terms of seeking out summer internship opportunities in Africa versus the United States. Did you ever think you'd be the 51st richest man in the world and the richest man in Africa? And how does that feel? <laughs> really, no. Not at all. You know, um, I've never really even thought of making it to the Pops list. That is to start with. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm really grateful to God that I'm there. But, you know, it is also tough to be there. Mm -hmm. When you are there, then you really, really have to make sure that you don't get thrown out of the list. <laughs> <laughs> and what would you say the key secret to your success has been? Uh, hard work. I okay. believe that, you know, we're very focused, we're a very focused company. We don't really go into things that we don't understand. You know, any business that I don't uh, understand it well, I don't do it at all. And that's really why, you know, uh, why we're successful. Mm -hmm. So you, you talked about hard work, you know. some. Rumors out that, that you work very long hours during the day, uh, in excess of 12 hours a day. So how do you balance both your professional life and your personal life? To start with, I don't really work 12 hours a day. <laughs> <laughs> I think I work at least, at least 18 hours a day. Okay. Wow. Yes, I do. <laughs> I do. Okay. I do. I mean, you know, um, on weekends, I don't work at all. Okay. I was fortunate to participate in the Idols West Africa competition and that really launched my career as a professional singer. I have two singles out at the moment. My career is taking off and I'm really excited about it. You know, it's something that I've waited for so long. For me, it's about pushing the limits. Like, if somebody say, look, you can't do this, I want to prove a point that even if I can do all of it, I know I can do something towards it. I'm an artist, <laughs> I'm a singer, and music is what drives me. So when you have a hectic work schedule, what do you, what kind, do you listen to music? What kind of music do you listen to to inspire you? It depends, you know, it depends on my mood, really. Sometimes I like to go out there and listen to our local music. I don't know whether you know what it's called, uh, King Sonia Day. Oh, yes. <laughs> There's nobody in this world that doesn't really like to hear music. I'm sure even the late uh, Osama, <laughs> I'm sure even as fanatic as he was, I'm sure he was listening to Something. music. Yes, you know. When I'm done with Harvard, I think coming back to Africa is a fantastic approach. I don't know if I'll come straight back to Zimbabwe because that's somewhere that I already have roots. And I think the future of Africa is pan-African. So I'd like to try out a few other countries before I head home. I'm coming home because Africa is the future, and I feel like I have a lot to offer. And places like Australia, England, the US, they've got talent there, but Africa needs people to come home so that we can grow this continent. I'm wondering if you can run through some of the key factors that make Africa one of the best places to succeed in business, and maybe some of the things that make it also the hardest place to succeed in business. Well, Africa, you know, the thing is that most of what you hear about Africa, you know, some of them are actually just uh, here, see, the, it's just perception of people that uh, some of them, they are too lazy to find out whether Africa is really good or bad. They must have heard from somebody saying that, look, Africa is not a good place to do business, it's tough. But things have actually changed, and we are the only continent that's really been growing at about 5% of GDP. You know, so the area where you need to go in and invest and make money definitely is, uh, you know, uh, Africa. So coming from where you were as a young man starting off business and seeing the youth of today, what do you think is the difference between when you started out then and where we as young people are now? Well, the problem with the, some of our younger generation today, they just want to jump and see themselves up there, you know, mm. overnight. Uh, it doesn't really happen. What you need to do is to be very, very focused as a person and be dedicated to whatever that you are doing. It is not really good for you to now go and try something, then after a month you just say, no, it doesn't work. You jump into uh, something else. else. 
I think you need to be very, very focused in what you are doing. Once you believe in what you are doing, you see, you should not take your either business or job as something that you must do. Okay, you must take it as it's part of your hobby. If it's part of your hobby, then you do it better. The reality in Nigeria is, you know, you have two major classes. There's the upper class and there's the lower class. There's the middle class, but the population of the middle class is really, really small. And every economy needs a vibrant, strong middle class because that way they can service the rich and employ the poor. But for Nigeria, it's not really that way. So many Nigerians live under the breadline. So sad. So, so sad. In Nigeria, it's assumed that um, they're just two different classes, just the rich and then the poor. Now, is, is, is this because of privatization or corruption or why is this? And if this is, what, what can the government or people like you do to build that middle class? Uh, in Nigeria, uh, I think, yes, corruption maybe was actually part of it for mm. not creating that middle class. But if you look at it, power alone, can create a lot of middle class in Nigeria. Power, by us just having power. So if the government fixes power in the next one or two years, you see quite a lot of people coming from the yeah. poor segment to that middle class segment. You know, there was a study by, I don't know whether it was Goldman Sachs, by one of the firms saying that if Nigeria can have one additional uh, hour of power, our GDP will grow to 9%. Mm. Uh, the potentials here, they are enormous. MTN, everywhere you go. Through pure determination and hard work, Nigerian entrepreneur Aliko Dangote is now placed number 51 on Forbes and hails as the richest man in Africa. We gathered five young entrepreneurs from all over Africa to come through and get some insights from the man himself. I think young Africans are hungry for success. They are working very hard to make sure that life is better. The African Youth Energy Tour business is very strong. I think that the entrepreneurial spirit is at a very high High pitch. My personal belief, I believe that more people should come out of school and create jobs rather than looking for jobs. I think the job market has dried up and people are becoming a lot more entrepreneurial. So I think that Africans are taking a very pan-African approach to business. What advice would you give young people who come out of university in Nigeria, the job opportunities are limited. What, what, what is what next for a young man that comes out of school? It's true, uh, there are very few people that are offering uh, jobs. But you know, Nigeria too, at the same time, is a country of where people always want to be their own Boss. bosses. Mm -hmm. So, and that's what I keep saying. If there's enough power today, you see 60% of young graduates, they are very, very creative. They can go and do their own business. And you know, they can come out of it even much, much better than working for somebody. I started my own record label. It's called Miss Dynamite Entertainment. People be wondering why Miss Dynamite is because for me, I'm a Dynamite. <laughs> I was dubbed into Dynamite on Idols West Africa by one of the judges and they said, oh, Dynamite comes in small packages. I'm a young woman myself trying to do something with my career, my voice, my talent, and I want to help other young female artists who don't have that platform to show the world that each and every individual these women are gifted and bring out the dynamite in each and every one of them. Now, to run a billion dollar corporation such as yours, a Dangote Group, one has to have a very good leadership skill. So can you give us any uh, advice as to how to be a good leader? Well, how to be a good leader, you have to be a very good listener. You have to listen to people. You have to also listen to quite a, um, a lot of advice. You have to make sure that it is not what you tell people to do. You have to, you know, crack your brains and have quite a lot of uh, uh, what you call advice from your own uh, team. You know, it has to be a teamwork because there's no way you can make it as a person without a good team. Dangote is everywhere. Sugar, cement, and he has the largest you know, market share 
So obviously, it's difficult for a young company to break into that market and sell sugar to Nigerians or cement or any of these products because Dangote is so huge and massive. We need that monopoly to be broken so that more people can get into the industry. It's competition. I mean, sugar price in Nigeria is determined with Dangote. If he decides to take it up, fine. If he decides to bring it down, that's fine. So it's just basically the god of all these products. This, this, this news that Dangote has monopoly over everything and there's no competition, which is not healthy for the country. What's your opinion on that? Well, you see, the problem is that it's not the question that uh, Dangote has monopoly. Dangote does not really have any monopoly. The difference is that uh, we are a company that actually believe in Nigeria. And because we believe in Nigeria, we always go out there and invest heavily. You know, whereas other people are watching. But as soon as now it gets to a certain point, then people will start screaming, talking about monopoly. There's nothing like mon monopoly. Because there's nothing that we do that we're the only ones doing that product, be it cement, be it flour, be it anything. And the laws are the same. You know, government will always bring regulations that will affect either Dangote or it will affect uh, any other competitor of Dangote. So there's no difference at all. It's not the question that, no, yes, it is a monopoly. It looks like monopoly because people are not investing. If you don't mm -hmm. invest, you will not be forced to participate. But if you invest, then yes, it means that, yes, you know, I mean, it is a fair playing ground where if you decide today as a Chinese company to come into what you are doing, we don't have any powers to stop you. So there's no monopoly at all. But it's just the share size of the company that people believe that yes it is a monopoly once you hear them go to say hey, you know nobody mm -hmm. really gets into that kind of business mm -hmm. but it's not so really there's nothing like that at all i'm doing a master's in public administration at the harvard kennedy school of government currently i'm interning with the tony elemento foundation here in lagos in nigeria uh, they do a lot of work in the sort of private enterprise area so they're looking at sort of funding entrepreneurship in Africa and they sort of see entrepreneurship as the way forward, which is very much in line with my interests. Um, so if I want to be the next Dangote of Africa, what advice would you give me? What do I need to do to become you? <laughs> <laughs> That's a very, very uh, tough one. You know, maybe I might have to charge you. Businessman. <laughs> <laughs> Lesson number one. No, I mean, to be serious, if you want to be the next Dangote is that uh, you have to have a very big heart. You have to take quite a lot of risk, calculated risk. First of all, you have to make sure that you are honest. You must make sure that you don't destroy the name, you know, because your name is very important. That the most valuable asset that you have going forward. Because if you don't have a good name, even the banks, doesn't matter how big you are, they're not going to touch you True. at all. So you must make sure that you have a very, very good name. And uh, number three, you have to make sure that you say that, look, nothing is impossible. Once you say that, yes, nothing is impossible, it means that you can actually achieve that target. Don't go to, you need a bit of luck, but <laughs> hard work, hard work is key. And what, what continues to drive you? If I had billions and billions of dollars in my bank account, I might stay in bed one day, but you're still working 18-hour days. So what is it but that you why, 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 why would you like to stay in bed? You know, I mean, <laughs> because I've made it. <laughs> You know, money is something that is really very funny. You can have it today, and it might not be there tomorrow. Sure. So you must keep this thing. You have to have quite a lot of respect for it. You just don't spend it anyhow. I don't really spend my money anyhow. What's the most expensive thing you've ever bought? The most expensive uh, toy I've ever bought was my, yes, <laughs> was my aircraft. Okay. You know, yes, you know, I bought, uh, you know, one that cost me about fifty million dollars. Okay. Yeah. Mm, yes, you know, but that's so it's that's, an expensive toy. <laughs> that's what you would call it. Toy, yeah. Just to wrap up, yeah. What do you think young people can practically do to create change? And I'm talking about a young Ghanaian boy sitting there watching this on television from his sitting room. And after watching the show, what's the next practical step he can take to create change? Well, the most practical thing is for him to know that, yes, once there's life, there's hope. Mm. And he himself, he can make it to the top. You look at a lot of people and say, OK, fine, look, 
as a young. In fact, you guys, you even have a better future than us because you are well educated. Not only that, you know, I mean, you know, today you are talking of uh, IT, mm. uh, you know, teen ages, mm. where things are much, much, much uh, easy. When, you know, we were growing up, there was even no mobile phones at all. But right now you have Facebook, you have Twitter, you know, everything is there at your fingertips. What we need is that most of you guys, when you finish your studies, you should come back home and also contribute to your quota. Because if you don't really come, then it will put us at a greater disadvantage. Yeah. So you have to come back home and also contribute to your own quota. That's what will only change uh, Africa. If you keep staying out there, then Africa will never change at home. Uh. Meeting Dan Gote was inspirational and I think the one takeaway that I take from the interview was that nothing is impossible. And if a man who's that rich and that accomplished can say nothing is impossible, then what's to stop me? His advice is very simple. You can really be whatever you want to be. You know, you just have to work hard at it. Determination. Aim really, really high. Less sleep. And, you know, pray for a bit of luck. I definitely learned today that I always have to believe in myself. I have to believe in my dreams, my visions, my goals, and always believe that there's a possibility in everything. MTN. Everywhere you go.